The following episode was originally recorded for a private podcast as part of the Equip for Life course. It has been edited for public release, but may reference training material from the Equip for Life course. Given the topic of social media, I wanted to start by showing you guys something amazing that Michelle Hendrickson from Students for Life sent me the other day. I don't know. Have you ever, have you guys heard of this YouTube channel, Awaken with JP? No. Do you know what this is? I don't think so. This is this, this redheaded vegan guy or he pretends to be vegan this kind of his oh, like caricature yeah. you, now you know who this is yeah so he's this he's this redheaded oh, guy that started this youtube channel a while like a back beard. yeah kind of yeah i don't I, I might know who this is I'm not he sure. talks about like being gluten-free yeah he's vegan. got like all these videos on and it's just he's making fun of vegans and, and those kinds yeah. of people and so i watched for a while and then i, I it kind of got old for me eventually but apparently now he's moving on to other things like social justice warriors and so i'm just gonna play you like a third of this amazing video i'll link to the full thing <laughs> but it's pretty amazing so this yeah, is okay. him being a social justice warrior comment threads and twitter feeds are easy places for me to set people straight i have a track record of changing people's minds 100 percent of the time when i leave angry comments online <laughs> i am a social justice warrior <laughs> this is my keyboard see it when i'm behind it i'm invincible i can say anything without consequence <laughs> It helps me dish out social justice. <laughs> Serving size large. What happens if I catch you saying something politically incorrect? I hit you with my five-step protocol. Step one, I ignore what you have to say. <laughs> Step two, I make huge assumptions about what you meant, and then I inform you about what you meant by what you said. <laughs> Step three, I correct you. I tell you what you should think, while also getting the point across that you're a terrible person. Step four, I turn my caps lock key on once you start trying to stand up for your own free will. Step five, finally, I hit you with my trump card where I trivialize your entire being into a one word label, like telling you you're a racist, you're a sexist, you're a misogynist, you're homophobic, you're heterophobic, you're transphobic, you're human phobic. I'm like a doctor handing out complex diagnoses. <laughs> when I decide to label someone with one word, I don't have to use my brain to understand them because I have a preformed understanding of the one word that I use to label them. So I can just understand the word that I decided to call them instead of understanding them. I don't actually stand for anything. <laughs> I just crusade against everything I don't stand for, which happens to be everything because I don't stand for anything. <laughs> It's like I take on the virtues of cancer, <laughs> and then I spread those virtues when I attack. I spend my days and nights vigilantly patrolling the internet for anything that's not politically correct, which is everything. I'm like the Batman of the online world. I usually spend about four hours a day compulsively checking Twitter. I have 83 followers, <laughs> and I follow over 800,000 people which means people are severely interested in what I have to say. And then I spend another casual five hours a day looking for other opportunities online to assert social justice. I accomplish so much in a day that you can't even measure it. My purpose in life is to be right. Luckily, I'm always right. My ability to always be right is based on my ability to point out how everybody else is always wrong. That, that captures the, like, the general essence of like th this feeling from people that are online all the time of so like not just the self-righteousness, but the like genuine feeling that they're doing this great amount of good. Yeah. yeah. And that's, that's really impressive. Well done. So we've got 35 practical dialogue tips that we want to talk about. <laughs> probably not just today, yeah. but probably over a series of two or three episodes. But before we jumped into dialogue tips, I stumbled upon a video a couple of weeks ago and sent it to Tim. I was like, this might be something worth talking about at least just for a little while. And some of you have probably already seen it. And I was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> some of you have probably already seen this. It's gone fairly viral. It's this Facebook exec. He was one of the, I think he was one of the founders of Facebook, or at least or early on, he was very, very high up on the team. He, he was like the director of growth, of, of getting more people onto the platform. And he made a whole lot of money and he was really influential over there. And now he's having regrets over things that they did. And so he's given multiple interviews on this topic, but there's one that he gave in front of his live audience. There's like a QA and a for like 30 minutes and multiple clips from this thing has gone viral. I just want to play like five minutes of it, of him talking about kind of the effect that Facebook has had on society. So we can talk about that a little bit. I want to bring us back to the point that you were making about 
exploiting consumer behavior in a consumer internet business. You said that this is a time for soul searching in social media businesses, and, and you were part of building the largest one. What soul searching are you doing right now on that? I feel tremendous guilt. Um, I, think we, I think we all knew in the back of our minds even though we feigned this whole line of like, there probably aren't any really bad unintended consequences. I think in the back, deep, deep recesses of our minds, we, we kind of knew something bad could happen. But I think the way we defined it was not like this. It literally is a point now where I think we have created tools that are ripping apart the social fabric of how society works. That is truly where we are. And I would encourage all of you as the future leaders of the world to really internalize how important this is. If you feed the beast, that beast will destroy you. If you push back on it, we have a chance to control it and rein it in. And it is a point in time where people need to hard break from some of these tools and the things that you rely on. The short-term dopamine-driven feedback loops that we have created are destroying how society works. No civil discourse, no cooperation, misinformation, mistruth. And it's not an American problem. This is not about Russian ads. This is a global problem. So we are in a really bad state of affairs right now, in my opinion. It is, it is eroding the core foundations of how people behave by and between each other. Um, and I don't have a good solution. You know, my solution is I just don't use these tools anymore. I haven't for years. It's created huge tension with my friends, huge tensions in my social circles. Um, if you look at like, you know, my Facebook feed, I probably haven't, I've posted maybe two times in seven years, three times, five times, it's like just, it's less than 10. Um, and it's weird, I guess I kind of just innately didn't want to get programmed. And so I just turned, tuned it out but I didn't confront it. And now to see what's happening, it's really, it really, it really bums me out. Like think about, like there were these examples where um, there was a hoax in WhatsApp where um, in some like village in India, um, people were like afraid that their kids were gonna get kidnapped, etc. And then there were these lynchings that happened as a result where people were like vigilante running around, they think they found the person and they, I mean, I mean, seriously? Like that's what we're dealing with. You know, Im imagine like when you take that to the extreme where, you know, bad actors can now manipulate large swaths of people to do anything you want. It's just a, it's a really, really bad state of affairs. And we compound the problem, right? We curate our lives around this perceived sense of perfection because we get rewarded in these short-term signals, hearts, likes, thumbs up, and we conflate that with value and we conflate it with truth. And instead, what it really is is fake, brittle popularity that's short-term and that leaves you even more, and admit it, vacant and empty before you did it. Because then it forces you into this vicious cycle where you're like, what's the next thing I need to do now? Because I need it back. Think about that compounded by 2 billion people. And then think about how people react then to the perceptions of others. It's just a, it's a really bad. It's really, really bad. It sounds like you're taking deep personal responsibility also in, in being a part of it. I kind of look, I did a, I did what I, I did a great job there and I think that business overwhelmingly does positive good in the world. Where I have decided to spend my time is to take the capital that they rewarded me with and now focus on the structural changes that I can control. I can't control that. I can control my decisions, which is I don't use this shit. Um, I can control my kids' decisions, which is they're not allowed to use this shit. <laughs> um, and then I can go focus on diabetes and education and climate change. And that's what I can do. But everybody else has to soul search a little bit more about what you're willing to do because your behaviors, you don't realize it, but you are being programmed. It was unintentional, but now you got to decide how much you're willing to give up. 
how much of your intellectual independence. And don't think, oh yeah, not me, I'm a genius, I'm at Stanford. You're probably the most likely to fucking fall for it. Because <laughs> you were fucking checkboxing your whole goddamn life. No offense, guys. None taken. <laughs> first thing I want to say is imagine you're being told by your doctor that you should take this drug mm -hmm. and this drug is going to solve all your problems. Mm -hmm. And then you, you found out that your doctor has the exact same problems you do. He's like, well, I'm not taking that drug. <laughs> 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 yeah. I, I, I know too much about what's in there. It's not good for you. Yeah. It's like you wouldn't take that drug. Yeah. This guy knows a lot more about what's going on in Facebook and the kinds of effects that it has on people. And he referred to dopamine feedback mm -hmm. loops and his awareness of how this works. He programmed the dang thing. It goes way beyond most people and he won't use it and yeah. he won't let his kids use it mm -hmm. because he doesn't want to be programmed. That says a lot. Yeah. This is dangerous stuff. Yeah. And it's interesting how strong his language was. Mm -hmm. He said something like, he created tools that are ripping apart social fabric of society or something mm -hmm. like that. Those are really strong words yeah. given social fabric of society you would think would go beyond something like social media. But I think he's really, I think he's right. Like if you look at the way people interact in general, it's yeah. not just the way people interact on social media. The way they've interacted on social media, the way they can't help but interact on social media because it's what the game board is set for you to do. You're a pawn, the other person's a pawn, you run into each other, and you got nowhere to go. That's the game board of Facebook arguments. And so, of course, it becomes completely unproductive and terrible. But then that pattern of how you interact, particularly on something like political, bleeds into other interactions. You know, like, and now we have this polarization problem. So much of it, I think, has everything to do with um, how social media is designed. I think there was a lot of wisdom in what he was saying because like Tim was saying, like this guy created, I think he described it as a monster. Like he feels like it's completely destroying yeah. and doing the opposite of what social media was intended to do. It was intended to bring people closer together and help us connect. And in some ways yeah. it does that. I think, you know, maybe the exception of our grandmothers and our ourselves <laughs> can connect over Facebook, but the rest of it, it's destroying friendships. Yeah. Okay, so there's kind of this awkward thing going on where we're talking about how awful <laughs> Facebook is and how awful it affects people, and yet this is supposed to be the tips for social media dialogue <laughs> podcast. So let's let's talk about the elephant in the room. Like I, I, I don't think where we're going here is everyone delete your Facebook account no. ne necessarily. That's that's not where we're going. I was working on my presentation for Students for Life conference yesterday. And I'm very much in a mindset of I'm, I'm being very upfront about my opinions about social media dialogue and how terrible it is, while at the same time saying good can be done. I think everyone should take it really seriously, whether or not it's a good use of their time, uh, whether or not it's a good use of their emotional energy. And mm -hmm. probably for a lot of people, they would just be happier if they didn't do it. I think Facebook is the kind of thing, like it, it pulls you in and it draws you in psychologically. Yeah. You've got dopamine loops and all that kind of stuff. And because of that, it's easier to think, man, like I'm doing so much good when probably in a lot of cases, it's not actually doing that much good. But yeah. in some cases, there is some good. Yeah. I think there's like a, I, I need to figure out like a way to chart this graph. Like if, if you're like, if you're a 10 skill level, like if you're Dustin Stevie. Yeah. And you are just really good at both being really, really clear and gracious and also like like really effectively and concisely interacting with the opposing viewpoint. And like you do that on a consistent and you know basis. Your stuff. You know and you know your stuff, you can do a lot of good. I think I think Dustin does a lot of good. Yeah. And I'm trying to think of anyone in my Facebook feed that's that's anywhere near his caliber. And I don't think there's there's so another single Facebook, person. All the Facebook friends listening that are on like, like, like no sorry. offense. <laughs> like like Dustin Stevie is a ten. And there, are, I've got maybe a, maybe a few nines. Yeah. And I, I do strongly suspect that anyone under a nine probably has an overinflated sense of how much good they're doing. So yeah. Don't say that no good is being done. Like I know I'm coming off really pessimistic right. here. I'm just saying I think that the psychological aspects of Facebook overinflates it in our own minds. It goes back to the thing that we've we've talked about on the graphic pictures thing. Is sometimes like regardless of your outreach technique, sometimes you kind of want to psychologically 
pat yourself on the back more right. than maybe if you had a completely unbiased, you know, outside observer watching, right? Who was also omniscient and knew how like the other person was affected and everything. Yeah. They might say, yeah, it wasn't as good as you thought. I know you really, really want to think that you changed the world today and you did some good things, but it doesn't mean it couldn't have been better. Like I think there's a similar kind of a psychological pull that that happens. That's definitely something that's really hard to measure because I think even if I was trying to rate one of my Facebook friends on that scale, it's really hard to determine how much good they're actually doing because we don't know what's happening outside of Facebook in the people's minds that they've right. discussed things with or whatnot. But my guess is that most people are going to put themselves up there in the seven, eight, nine range if they're on Facebook a lot. And those people who are on Facebook dueling it out in the comment section, I would probably put in the one, two, three range. Right. At least the ones I've seen that are not my Facebook friends. So I think it's hard to measure and it's hard to be objective. I think nobody should trust their own compass on how good they are at this. If you're wondering whether or not this is a good use of your time, arguing about abortion or politics or anything else on Facebook, talk to a, like a friend that you respect, not like your best buddy who you know, is just going to like support you no matter what kind of a kind of a person, someone you respect, maybe your pastor or something like and say, here's an example of like one of my Facebook conversations. How much good do you think I'm doing for the world? And how much harm am I doing to my own soul? Yeah. And I re like really, I, like, I know how pessimistic all of this sounds. I don't actually think that everyone should get off. Yeah. But probably a lot of people should. Yeah, like I, I think that the message that that I would send is is I is I, I would encourage people to, even if you've thought about this overall topic before, to think about it again. I'm going to link to that entire speech that I gave. I'm also going to link to a longer video that someone posted on Reddit and called it a documentary. It's not a documentary, but it's like a guy who pulled a bunch of clips that are similar, including one of the other. Like I think he's the CEO of Facebook, making some kind of similar comments, and then. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Morgan Freeman actually had a really interesting comment was you wouldn't expect, you know, Morgan Freeman necessarily to be this like super, you know, I know he's played God a couple times, but it, it, <laughs> you don't think of him as like the, the smartest guy in Hollywood. But it's like, wow, that's a really. So anyway, I was tempted to like grab all these different clips, but it's like, yeah, just, we can't just, do that a whole podcast. Just watch the <laughs> watch the video and, and, and think about it. And then, you know, I was sending videos to, to Tim over the last week because I was finding other things like there's a TED talk. I thought was really interesting with kind of an argument for why you should get off Facebook and kind of responses to some of the most common counter arguments. And it made me think he had a lot of, I thought, really good things to say. I think my conclusion, like what what's happening for me is I have greatly reduced my Facebook usage. And I don't think that's going to change. I'm probably yeah. at something like 20 or 25% of what I did a couple of years ago. And I don't think I'm going to greatly increase it. I almost know I, I don't look at my Facebook newsfeed much. I post every once in a while, like my personal profile, maybe, I don't know, once a week or less. Like I try to maintain the ERI pages, basically, and respond to comments. And everyone, like I'm trying to say happy birthday to people, you know, it's their birthdays. Like there's a few things I'm trying to do. But for the most part, uh, it's not my go-to place for like entertainment or social interaction the way that it once was. So I don't think I'm going to totally get off of it, but I think I'm pretty happy with what I'm doing right now, but it's super different than what it used to be. All right. So having said all that, you want to get some practical <laughs> tips on how to do this on, well, if you're going to do it. On the occasions, if, if, you, if you must, if you must dialogue on Facebook, <laughs> and do these on things. On the occasions when it's a good idea, uh, I think these are the, the best moves to having the least bad experience if, if all other things are being equal i would way rather an equip for life course member be dialoguing with people on facebook than a, yeah a lot of other people so um so we've got 35 let's be honest it's not like everyone listening to this podcast is just gonna stop yeah. arguing on facebook anyway so it's, it's okay even though we're generally in the pessimistic kind of territory like it's still good like okay do your best here's the best yeah the, the listeners are probably not jumping off Facebook now. They're just a little bit sadder now <laughs> as a result of the last 10 minutes. So we've got 35 tips here, and we'll, we'll try to go fairly quickly through these. Like a lot of these, I just feel like, are fairly obvious once you say them, and so they don't need a ton of commentary yeah. from all of us. I really like, uh, Tim, how you separated these into five different categories. We've got general strategy, mindset, uh, practical moves for lowering defenses, 
tips that are specific to social media and then practical argumentation. And so I like we're going to kind of keep those separate and let's just start talking through these and we'll see how far we get before we decide, yeah, we should end this one and, and save the rest for, you know, part two or whatever. It sounds good. Do you want to just kind of introduce the, where, the where, background context? Where we got some of this? Yeah. yeah. So a while back and I didn't take the time because looking through like a Facebook page history takes forever. Like there's not a good search feature for this. So I don't remember when I did this. I think it probably happened after we'd started ERI, but it probably was in like the first year if so, or it also could have been plausibly the year before we started ERI when I had a personal page. But either way, at some point on one of my Facebook things, <laughs> I posted a basically an open call for social media dialogue tips said, you know, if you follow my work or your eyes work, maybe I don't remember what I said. I don't, I don't have like the actual language of, of the question, but it's something like if, if you follow this work, I'm you know, you probably do dialogue on social media. Obviously there's some ways to do it well and some ways to not do it well. What things have you picked up and learned? And there were a lot of comments. It was a, a lot of people engaged with it. And I had copied and pasted <laughs> all of that into a big word document that I then did nothing with. I think I had planned to do like a blog post at some point or, and, and it just, it didn't happen. And so then when we were doing kind of prep to record this kind of series of social media dialogue podcasts, I just like looked at my Google docs for social media to like see what I had saved from way back when. And I found this document. So luckily I've like kept the names of the people who had tips. So, so some of these tips aren't from us. Some of these tips are, have come from people that have followed either ERI or me. We'll be citing them as we go through here, but there's some really good things here. There's also some tips that we had all come up with. We all independently came up with our own list of practical tips, and then we kind of all shared them with Tim. And surprise, surprise, a lot of us did the same thing. <laughs> some of these are, you know, again, it's maybe not obvious until you hear it, but then when you hear it, it's like, oh yeah, that's that's a, that's a pretty good point. And so was that kind of what you were getting yes. at? Yes. Like particularly the, the fact that some of these are from other like people. Other people, yeah. Yeah. And some people who bought the course. So you might hear yourself quoted and you're like, I don't even remember saying that, but that was pretty smart of me. That was pretty there's, good. There's a lot of Nadia. Hi, Nadia. Yeah. <laughs> Andrew Unix on here. So yeah. So uh, let's let's start with, uh, we've just got uh, three tips that you categorize as general strategy. Do you want to talk about that first one, Tim? Sure. Um, so this is kind of the, I very intentionally ordered this one first because I see this as like, the fundamental context by which all of these other points depend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Which it is something that we all came up with independently in some form or another, which is move the conversation to private message or in person as soon as possible. Yep. Um, or to, to Skype. Um, uh, that's another uh, possibility. And, uh, one, and Josh added, once you're in personal, uh, once you're in private message, get personal. So much of what's going on, what we've talked about in the previous podcasts on uh, issues with social media has to do with the fact that we're in this public environment where people are in like a Pavlovian way focused on their self-image and like Pavlov's dog. Like he rings the bell and the dog salivates. Like as soon as you go on social media, you're just like, ah, self-image. And so you get out of that environment and into an environment where you're just talking one-on-one -on -one and then things are going to be a lot better. But social media is actually a really, a really good place in some cases for starting a conversation. Um, this is like the most positive thing I'm going to say about social media <laughs> like for the, all day. For this whole all day is it's, it's sometimes a fantastic place to get a conversation started. So something that I did a while ago, just as an example, I came upon an article on like transgender ideology from a conservative perspective. Mm -hmm. And I read the article and was like, yeah, this is basically my view. And I was trying to think about like what a good counter argument would be. And I couldn't think of a good counter argument. And so I posted the article and said, hey, I don't want to get an argument, but I don't think that I understand the other side because I'm reading this and I think I agree with this and I can't think of any reasonable response. And so help me out here. And some of my leftist friends, including some of my trans friends came in and gave some helpful responses and they didn't change my opinion at the time, but that actually opened doors to hmm. further conversation down the road as well. Yeah. Like that's a great use of Facebook, but t starting from that article and then be like, all right, now let's have a, like a big knockdown throwdown thing. Right. That's, that's way less good. Start it on Facebook. That's great. It's a good, good place to get things started. Move it to private message as soon as possible. Yep. This may this tip may sound a little bit like we're still being pessimistic and <laughs> oh you should be using social media Don't dialogue. Don't really do social media. <laughs> Just use it to get in, in person. Um, and so I do want to kind of address if you're a person who doesn't have a lot of in person conversations 
and the majority of the time you're talking about abortion, you're talking about it online, realize that, yes, that is a little bit more of a comfortable spot. To be behind the keyboard and reaching out to people is maybe a place to start. Like if outreach terrifies you, (laughs) if the idea of outreach terrifies you and you have to start on Facebook, I would say that's okay, but you don't want to sit there forever. You do want to actually have in-person conversations about abortion. And so don't use Facebook as you know, an excuse to not do the best outreach that you can because you want to be the best pro-life advocate that you can be. And people are more likely to change their minds when they feel emotionally safe and they feel more emotionally safe in person where they can humanize you and not be all defensive. And I, I don't feel like I have anything I need to add to this. This is like, <laughs> this is like I, I, I think we talked about this a bit in, in relational apologetics too. This is I have had great friendships that with with people from other sides of different issues that have started in kind of a public forum like Facebook and in every there's not one single case where it didn't get better once we got into a more private kind of a one-on-one exchange whether that was on Facebook private message whether it was emails whether it was Skype whether it was in person it's always better because we're not dealing with this like I'm worried about how everyone else will I, 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 I I will give an example. So Andrew, I'm pretty sure Andrew's going to be fine with me talking about this. Andrew, who we've talked about on the podcast before, if you haven't listened to the first relational apologetics thing, then that would be what where to go if you want to hear about my friendship with with Andrew. But Andrew had this really cool idea relatively recently, I don't know, like three or four or five months ago, of being more intentional in our conversations about spending more time than we had been for a while, like actually... I don't want to say necessarily debating issues, but kind of engaging with each other's ideas on things where we might disagree. And so Andrew's saying like specifically like we're really wanting to get out of confirmation bias, get out of echo chambers. So let's both like have each other watch stuff that like we agree with and the other person's not going to agree with. And both so we can kind of like, so like there's a lot of Sam Harris stuff that we're going to be getting into. I've got some kind of cool new Christian apologetics videos that Tim turned me on to that we're going to talk about. And, and so anyway, so recently there is this uh, speech, there's this like full speech from this, I think it was a Harvard professor, Glenn Lowry on kind of race relations and what's going on with the criminal justice system being unfair to African-Americans. And we've created this private secret Facebook group that's just us just because it's like the easiest way for us to like post a link and do comments and stuff like that and so I was able to I didn't end up typing my response to the Glenn Lowry thing because it would take too long I just like recorded like a video at my webcam of just like kind of just like here's my reaction to this speech for like 15 minutes or something like that and just I didn't edit a thing I just posted it up there it's just for Andrew here's kind of some thoughts let's talk and because I knew it was just us and because I trust Andrew not to go and grab that like YouTube link and blast it to everybody, I was able to feel safe to not be like tripping over myself, trying to make sure that I can't be taken as, you know, the some racist white racist guy or, or whatever. Like there, there's still some, I was doing some clarifying stuff just to try to be as clear as I could, but it's just kind of a safe place, you know, in that place. Whereas I would never have posted a video like that unedited, unlike having yeah. like really thought about it isn't like an open critique of this guy because I had, I don't have enough research yet. I'm just like in kind of engaging with, it. I'm, I'm like just getting the conversation kind of more going mm-hmm. because it's one-on-one. I feel super comfortable just doing that because we have that trust and it means that we can get a lot more talked about a lot sooner and we can be in the meat of it. We're not arguing about each other's characters. <laughs> you know, we're like, let's talk about this Guy's statistics and the problems that he's pointing out and all of that. You're using the medium of Facebook to your advantage yep. for your one-on-one interaction. Yep. That's good. That's cool. Practical tip number two, make minimal persuasion goals. It's more of a marathon on Facebook than it is at Outreach. Hmm. And Jake Simon added a kind of a similar point. He says, start by determining your goals. Are you seeking to correct misunderstanding or misrepresentation for the benefit of others or to have a productive dialogue with an individual to change their mind? If it's the latter take it to PM as quickly as possible. So Jake is generally uh, in, in alignment with us on that. I think this is a helpful thing for me to keep in mind, um, particularly because there are certain kinds of things about the Facebook medium that don't really do us favors. Like I think this private Facebook group thing is kind of a cool idea. But in general, things like the way comment threads display, yeah. you wind up with these problems if, you, if you're having an argument that gets too complicated and is covering too much ground because... 
people are missing parts of it. And even if they're trying, they're getting things out of context because they're forgetting what came first. Because they don't reread the whole discussion in right. context every time they respond. They read the last comment and they forget what came before that. The con- You're lucky everything if they gets read all anything up. in the thread right. instead of just posting their own. Well, I'm just talking about <laughs> just the, per- the original person you were talking to. Okay. You also have the problem of, right. of bystander coming in, not paying attention to anything, right. and sometimes just blasting you right. because they're assuming bad things about you. And that's been kind of frustrating as well. And so the idea of if you must, if you must have an abortion uh, debate on Facebook, Facebook, have one on something that's very specific and localized. Yeah. Say, here's a pro-life argument, and I think this has some merit. Mm-hmm. It's a specific pro-life argument. Yeah. And if they were like, oh, yeah, well, what about this point? Nope, just talking about this thing today. <laughs> or you could say, here's a common pro-choice argument, and this is a bad pro-choice argument, and here's why. You're like, oh, yeah, well, the, this, the violinist argument's better. It's like, yeah, violinist argument's interesting. Not talking about that today. Let's talk about that another day. Right now, and just keep it really laser-focused. And if you keep it laser-focused, you keep your claims limited, um, and keep your persuasion goals limited, you're going to be in a better spot to like actually have some productive stuff and not have things go crazy. There's also this thing of, instead of your goal being, I'm going to get this person all the way from pro-choice to pro-life, it's that Greg Kokel thing. I'm going to put the pebble in their shoe. I'm going to give right. them something interesting to think about. This isn't going to be like, there's rarely the silver bullet where the person becomes pro-life because of one thing that someone says, one meme, one argument, one soundbite. It happens... It doesn't happen that often. It's going to be a long series of different arguments that they hear and probably stories that they hear that's going to connect with them emotionally and like all these different things that are going to happen for them to actually change their mind. And so it's just like just to avoid being super frustrated, set realistic goals, set attainable goals. We do this at outreach too. Like especially with if you're leading a Students for Life Club and you're about to do an outreach, make sure everyone's got the same attainable goals. Everyone in one dialogue. That's the goal. So at the end, we've talked about this before. I completely stole this from Justice for All. This is what I learned from Steve. Was, you know, everyone in the circle can raise their hand at the end because basically everyone's had a dialogue, like almost everyone. And probably most have had two, three, or four. And so you'll have all you know, gotten beyond those goals. But the problem is a lot of times students who've never done an outreach, you're coming thinking everyone's going to have 10 if they're like the excited student, not the terrified one. And they think that's a realistic goal. Yeah. And it's not. And there's going to be, everyone's going to be, it's going to be be a bummer at the end. It's like, man, this outreach sucked. No, it didn't. You had 50 conversations as a group. That's awesome. Like, let's celebrate that. But you've just got to start with attainable goals. And and changing someone's mind in general, like like uh, making them do 180, starting pro-choice and ending up pro-life, in any context, that's especially difficult on Facebook, but like even in any context, it's hard. And so if you have the expectation of, well, surely if I can just beat them down with enough of the, the, the truth or the, or the right arguments, I'm like, graciously, graciously, it's like eventually I'll you know, bang my head against that wall enough and it'll break. Like, no, your, your head's going to break first is what's actually going to happen. And like I, I'm, just, I'm thinking about myself here. Like I don't, I don't know how much you remember this. I'd be, I'd be actually really interested to know, Josh, if you uh, remember this at all. Back in like t- the Georgia Teens for Life days, mm-hmm. when I was like 18, like my actual mentality about pro life apologetics was there, there is some kind of perfect response to every false pro choice argument, and it's just a matter of discovering what it is. And figuring out how to phrase it correctly, yep. and then it's it's irrefutable. Yep. You can't you can't refute it. And so surely, if you just if you figure out enough of the the perfect responses, people will change their minds. Like that's actually the way my mind worked. Yep. And if that's you out there, it's not how it works. And so, <laughs> like having minimal goals is way way better. Yep. So Tim almost jumped the gun on this a little bit, but it's very related to <laughs> making <laughs> uh, minimal persuasion goals, and that's making limited claims. So we sometimes have to make big claims, something like abortion is wrong. Obviously, there's a lot of underlying pieces mm-hmm. that fit into that puzzle. But in general, you want to stick to being very focused And you only want to make a claim for something that you have to, right? So like take one piece at a time so that they can digest that, discuss that one point, and then you move on to the next. So this is almost like trying to stay organized in your conversation. And oftentimes people will try to take maybe one claim that you're making and make it really broad, but then it's really unmanageable and you can't address everything that's coming at you. And it can feel really overwhelming. And this happens a lot on Facebook, on social media, because 
there are other people commenting and jumping in. And if we're talking with 25 people at once and we're trying to change all of their minds, that's not an attainable goal. Nope. <laughs> so it's relax. Not real sit wise down. either. <laughs> So when Nadia made this point, I thought it was really good. And there's something, I don't remember if it was something that I added or if it's something that, that Nadia included in it, but it was this idea like, it's good if you can avoid a wall of text in your response just to, to make it less overwhelming. But if you have to do the wall of text, please, people on Facebook, learn how to do paragraph breaks. This isn't always obvious because a lot of times, like at some point, Facebook changed it to where as soon as you hit enter, or return, like it just posts it. And so you've got to figure out, I know on Mac it's shift enter or shift return to make a paragraph break. I think it's the same on PC, but I haven't used the PC in a long time. But figure out what that is. And the same thing in private, like in the private message thing, usually there's like a checkbox you can check that'll like uh, optionally, do you want when you hit enter for it to just post it or you want it to be prep? But you don't, I don't think have that option on normal Facebook unless you add a plugin or something to your browser that completely changes how Facebook acts. And so, Paragraph breaks, make it readable. Like no one is going to read this really long wall of text if you haven't had paragraph breaks with sys obnoxious. And people might act like they've read it. They've skimmed it. <laughs> this is one of the problems yeah. with a medium of Facebook. They skimmed the first They're 10 used to skimming. Of it. Yeah. Listening is way more difficult over text. So they are skimming. Like if you're having the conversation in person, you could maybe talk for what would be like two paragraphs written and they're tracking with you, right? If you do maybe two pages, they're going to like nod off. But I would say you can only get away with maybe four sentences before they start skimming it. Yeah, it's bad. Depends on the person. Yep. Let's talk about mindset. Those are the category tips. And so it's like one of the things that I've been talking about for a long time on the social media dialogue thing is don't underestimate in general the power of things like body language and nonverbal communication when you communicate with people figure that out and then realize you get none of that when you're on <laughs> facebook facebook you have just your text and you have your profile picture is basically it especially like if they're not facebook friends with you if they haven't had a bunch of you know hopefully you know was like the good side of baggage you know like positive baggage with you <laughs> positive like positive baggage. experiences with you in the background like like this is it it's just text and so if you think of just like how much tone matters in the way that someone kind of takes in what you're communicating you get no tone you get no body language and if anything if you're talking to someone who's on the other side of you probably they're actually just interpreting what you're saying as if you've got the worst tone, the worst body language. Yeah. You're just the like the most obnoxious pro-life person they've ever seen. Like that's what's in their head. And it's like that avatar putting the word, like, you know, like there's th those things on computer where you can like type in a script and it'll be like an AI thing, like read it back, but it'll be with like, you know, whatever avatar you want. Like it's just like making the mouse move or whatever. That's basically what you, what you are to them is you're like a, an obnoxious pro-lifer and the mouse moving and it's just your words said in the worst tone. And so keep that in mind. And the way that affects me is I basically, when I'm writing and even like editing or proofing my comment or post, especially if there's like, if it's like kind of a, a back and forth with a pro-choice person, one of the main things that I'm looking for is how do I make it the most likely this person is going to interpret this in the way that it's intended, which means in the end, I basically have to create a caricature. Of myself, like, like, you know, when people like on the beach will like, ha like draw those things, but it's like, they just like pick like your weirdest feature, like you've got a big nose. And so they make it a huge nose, like that <laughs> yeah. kind of thing. I am an exaggerated version of myself when I'm typing my comment. So I'm doing a lot more emoticons and smiley faces and exclamation marks and little jokes and common ground, like all these different things. I'm doing more than I would be if we were in person, because what my hope is that by the time they're receiving what I'm communicating, like, and it's been filtered through all of their baggage with other pro-lifers and all of their other stuff going on, that the end result will be pretty close to what I originally intended. But you've got to keep in mind, in the end, you're just using text or maybe inserting, you know, pictures or memes if you're getting really advanced or something like that. But for, it's basically just text. And that's just very little of the, like, what actually is involved when, when people are communicating with each other. It kind of reminds me of, I feel like I've made an analogy in the past to like if you're at a shooting range 
and you you're tending to the left, you kind of compensate by shooting to the right. Yeah, kind of a similar thing here. Like, like except the compensation is for the sake of the other person. Like the other person yeah. perceives it to the left, and so you got to like really swing to the right to, to, to the hopes that they'll actually get it kind of on target. I, I was I was thinking about this kind of concept recently, actually, and thinking through like so much of what we do in our practical dialogue tip material. We've got a lot of material on the books in the last couple of years. Um, a lot of that has to do with trying to help people to feel emotionally safe because people don't change their minds just on the basis of arguments. Right. Like arguments by themselves are a pretty small part of persuasion. Yeah. And on Facebook, it's like the only thing that you can control. <laughs> <laughs> it's like all of the non-argument things about persuasion, you have very, very little ability to control, which makes it really hard. And so I think it's it, this is a good point because you can at least – do your best. You yeah. can go out of your way to, to get the best shot at being able to control those dynamics, but it's hard. This also works in reverse in the way that you're interpreting the other person. So try to be extra charitable, Yeah. right? Really good point. Especially yeah. if you don't know them. So I, a lot of the uh, previous discussion of this tip has been kind of when you are interacting with someone that you don't know, who's not your friend. It's a little different if you are friends in real life and you're on Facebook and you're having this conversation but at the same time, I mean, you got to try to just give extra leeway. So the next point, number five, this is uh, one from Josh that I really liked. Um, post things with pro-choice people in mind. Will it make pro-lifers raise their fists but cause pro-choice people to be frustrated and less likely to talk to you, your friends, and all other pro-lifers? Then don't share it. I think actually this is the kind of thing that brings back to mind the, the kind of thing we were talking about in the last podcast when we are talking about virtue signaling, mm -hmm. where... What's a, what is a virtue signal to your tribe is like fingernails on a chalkboard to the opposite tribe. Yeah. And it's really easy when you're in kind of a natural virtue signaling kind of a mindset to be like, I want to like, I want to get some likes and get my dopamine fix or whatever for my wife and I. If, if one of us posts something on Facebook and the other person goes to Facebook <laughs> and check notifications, we're like, oh, all the affirmation. <laughs> That's what you're doing. It becomes even more natural to you. Like, I'm going to be like, hey, all the, all the pro-lifers are going to like, like what I'm going to have to say. But sometimes what you're sharing is actually kind of offensive to the other side because right. it's not very charitable or something. Right. And even if it's something that you like, you agree with the conclusion, but if it's uncharitably stated, that's a good reason to not share it if you're hoping to have positive future interactions with pro-choice people in your feed. It's really frustrating. Like there's entire websites. I can't post their stuff, even yeah. if it's good stuff. Like I can't post from, from LifeSite or Life News because they both tend to say either pro-abortion or pro-abort when they're referring to the other side. And like, I don't know anyone from LifeSite really, but Life News guy, Stephen Hertel, he's a good friend of mine. Like we really like each other. If I'm in Colorado, we hang out. We like, we personally re really like each other. He posts our stuff. We're, we've got a really good rapport. I like the guy. But then unfortunately, we just think differently about labels. Right. And a lot of the other people that write for Life News think very differently from us when it comes to labels. And so there are some times like where I've seen a good article on something like Life News and I'm like halfway through it and I'm and I'm like in my head in my my inner monologue is should I share this on Facebook and then halfway through and then it's and then pro board and it's just like oh I can't like instantly I, I I'm sorry it's like anything with that label is going to be blacklisted for me I will not share it even if I love everything else that you have to say yeah I'll still read it I'll still take it in and it might affect me if you're writing blog posts you want them to be shared with other people yeah. and there's just something like that where like because I know I've got pro-choice Facebook friends and frankly, I mean, we've talked about labels. Like, it's not that helpful, I think, for pro-lifers to read stuff that says pro-abort either. But especially for the pro-choice people that are on your yeah. list that you want to have a real relationship with, you can't if you're constantly sharing yeah. things that are really obnoxious to them or treat them like they're way worse or stupider or evil than they actually are. So we can think outside the box about this issue, though, because... You don't have to share it on your timeline. Like if you were reading an article which you think is going to be really helpful for mm -hmm. pro-life people to read, maybe inform them about something that's very relevant, mm -hmm. but would not be appropriate for a pro-choice audience, share that in a pro-life group on Facebook or over Messenger to specific pro-life friends who are mm -hmm. going to benefit. Sure. 
right? So you don't have to post it onto your timeline where you're interacting with a mixed audience. And I would say reserve the things which are appropriate for a mixed audience or even like Tim did with, you know, I need a response to this thing. Help me. Let's open up a discussion. And by thinking, you know, critically about this, we're being intentional and we're thinking through the post. It's not, I'm going to post this just for affirmations. If you are, then, you know, be aware that you're doing that. But you could also, <laughs> you could also be posting this, I'm going to try to start dialogues on Facebook with this post, or I'm going to try to inform pro-life people with this post, and it'll help you determine where you're sharing. Yeah. Like the, the hard thing for me, I, I, I hear what you're saying. And like, and there is a lot, there's even a period of time where I was trying to carefully like have a curated list of friends like I tagged as pro-life and friends I tagged as pro-choice like I kind of tried to do this the hard thing is for me at this point and I might be overly cautious so the thing of like is something that says pro-abort or is acting like all people who are pro-choice or who are liberal or whatever are dumb like I don't love the idea of conservatives reading that either because like I don't want to yeah. foster this this attitude in them so but sometimes there will be judgment calls I can imagine a case where they're supposed that it's just so brilliant or so unique that and like the only thing bad about it is this is pro-abortion like once like I could see myself sending it to some people and saying and like I, I might have the caveat I don't love like I, I don't think this label's really helpful maybe I wouldn't maybe I'd just say here this is I thought there's some good stuff in here but what's going to be going on in my head like my, my mental math is going to be in the end is this going to be so helpful to the person that it's kind of worth the risk of it being one more thing in the long list of conservative stuff that person has probably read or is listening to in the last year that is like one more liberals are all dumb like kind of thing so that, that, that that's part of the thing that's going on for me and i'm always have it's always judgment calls for me i hear you josh i think that's totally fair and i i want to see us as the pro-life community not supporting situations or articles where people are degrading other people. But I, I do see, you know, for the article that's about a pro-life legislative effort mm -hmm. or, you know, something that's specific to improving yourself as a pro-life activist or something like that, which just wouldn't necessarily be received well by pro-choice people, but not for a good reason. Mm -hmm. Or so, just sure. like where it's just missing the audience. Right. I do see people sharing that on their timeline and we sh I don't think we should be. Yeah. Because it, it, it just is kind of a turnoff and it's doing something negative that I can't put my finger on. I think it's, it's totally a fair point that there are sometimes a thing that you could share where the pro-choice person is not going to react to it well, but it's, it's more on the pro-choice person. Yeah. They're, they're being too sensitive or or, or sure. something and so there might be times where it is the best call to still post it and be like all right like i i did a i did a, one of the like you know i i think of like the tim brom facebook post where it's kind of like here's a question for all my friends of just like of this thing you know or whatever and it's about this bill that has felt like seems really really reasonable like i have a hard time imagining people disagreeing but i kind of want to know if they, they they're out there and so i posted it's kind of like this makes sense to me I, I i've read some stuff about this but it's kind of like the thing where like i knew it's possible that some people might disagree with it but it's like most likely unless i'm completely blind to something they're being pretty unreasonable if they're like oh i don't like this because this is really you know like whatever and be like i i'm willing for people to be unreasonable but i'm looking for things that are gonna be fairly kind of common groundy like you've got to be pretty unreasonable to react negatively to this and if if that's the case i'm willing to usually put on on the timeline all right number six this is the, the one that rachel preempted sorry <laughs> <laughs> also from nadia assume the best about people most people aren't trying to be rude slash get a rise, et cetera. They just feel strongly. Yep. I think this is a really good reminder. It's very easy when you're in the Facebook mentality. People say obnoxious, offensive things. Mentality. Yes, like the whole, the whole <laughs> mindset that goes along with Facebook. It's a it's like different reaction. version of you while you're in front of the You computer. are. I agree. I agree. the worst one. I like it. <laughs> yes. When you're like in that mindset, I think it's, it's, it's good to kind of have a, a reminder occasionally. Probably the person that's saying this very, very offensive thing is not doing it intentionally to be offensive. Yes. Yeah. Sometimes, yes, there are <laughs> trolls out there, yes. but probably not most well-meaning people. Yeah. Um, so I think that's helpful. If they're a troll, just move on. Don't waste your time. <laughs> yeah. Again, preempting, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, number seven is also from Nadia, although uh, Rachel had a very similar thing and so did Monica Snyder. Take a step back if you're feeling defensive. Yes. This is... 
One of my favorite points, I think, in the entire list of like 35, what Rachel wrote uh, on the Facebook feedback thing is, it is okay to take a step back from the conversation if you need to think about what the other person is saying, or if you feel like emotions are high, but they are trying to have a real conversation. It is best to respond within 24 hours and sending them a short message saying you want to think before responding so they know you are not ignoring them. I think that's a good kind of practical, like, here's how to manage that. If you just disappear, then that's problematic. Yeah. But in general, I think if you're going, if you must do some uh, Facebook debating <laughs> or dialoguing, know you're going into it, you're an alcoholic. You're an alcoholic going into a bar, you're in dangerous, hostile territory for your soul. Yeah. You're, you're going to put yourself in an environment where it's very natural for you to uh, act badly and to have uh, mental anger problems or anything else. And so if you're having a hard time, just stop and monitor yourself. If you are really angry and you're typing very quickly on your computer and then you're hitting send right away, rookie mistake. <laughs> That's like a red flag that you are yeah. in deep water yeah, and you need to take point. a step back count to 10, breathe. <laughs> Do we have one of these tips on like proofreading your stuff? Is that coming up later? I don't think so. Because, okay, so I'm just going to, I'm just going to re-say this. I've been Maybe talking just... about this uh, in, I've done this in multiple like Q&A sessions recently, where it's just kind of like, I, I started talking about this idea of like, when I type a Facebook comment in one of these things, like it's not every single time I post on Facebook, but in, in this context, if I'm doing this right, I'm proofreading at least twice. Once for clarity, so it's like typos, grammar, like did this sentence come out like the way that I like that'll make sense because a lot of times like when you're just typing like I've heard the best way to write and this is what I try to do I'm not perfect about this but I try to like when I'm writing like a blog post I'm trying to be completely right brain for the first draft and try to not be like thinking about ooh I don't like that there's all these typos so I got like all these red lines on the screen of like where Google is telling me you misspelled that you idiot like that kind of thing and I'm just like whatever it doesn't matter like I'm just trying to like get the stuff on there be completely right brain and then when you're done with the entire thing, then move to left brain and go and edit and, and do things. So that's what I'm usually doing on Facebook too. So first proof is I'm proofing for clarity and typos and things like that. But then the, the second, lines. yeah, I'm looking for the red <laughs> lines. And the second proofing is for tone is for, is this how I want to come across? How is this going to come across to people who are being, who are not only on the other side, but are also maybe less charitable than I am? Like this kind of goes back to the thing we talk about on the course, like make clarity your responsibility as much as possible. And so I'm looking for, does this come across a little too, especially given the fact that it's just text and just my, you know, the little tiny square avatar of like me and my wife, like, is this going to come across to them? And, and, and do I need to kind of scale it back? So at the very least, by the time it's filtered, they're not filtering it with obnoxious tone in it. This is one of the best advantages of talking online about abortion yep. because you don't have this in outreach. Yep. You don't have the chance to <laughs> proofread. You don't have the chance to take something back before you send it. So, like, use the few advantages you do have <laughs> as great. widely That's as so possible, good. honestly. <laughs> you know how many times I, like, say something that is really, like, dumb in person? <laughs> and, oh, I'm sorry, I did not mean that. I, I am, I, let me rephrase, you know? And uh, you just look like a fool in front of the other person. Like, that's fine. It happens to the best of us. But yeah. you don't have to have that on Facebook. So that's kind of nice. But it comes with good and bad. <laughs> Let me go back to the thing that you were talking about, Tim, about the kind of this idea of, of being an alcoholic walking in, into a bar. I, I, I know pro-life people. In fact, I was talking to a, a pro-life blogger recently, and we've talked about this a lot of times, where she was talking about how like she's had to go through times where she has to take like a month or three off from doing pro-life stuff, wow. like on Facebook. She's one of the bloggers at, at Secular Pro-Life, and I'm sorry, like Secular Pro-Life gets a lot of hate from a lot of pro-lifers like there's this kind of a special kind of hate that secular pro-life has to deal with because you've got a lot of like really really christian conservative pro-lifers that are super uncomfortable about young atheists kind of being involved and having a voice in this yeah. like that's just true for some people we know that's true and then you've also got like you know a lot of kind of uh, people on like the liberal leftist side that are expecting to have common ground with them in areas where they're not. And so they're all mad if they're like even friendly with anything that's concerned. And so it's like they, this kind of always getting embraced by everybody on both sides a lot. And so it's been it's like I just have to sometimes take a long time off 
and then kind of build back up the the steam where I oh I, I can get back involved in the pro life movement for a while, and I'm going to take another long break. Like she she feels really bad for me. She keeps saying like I feel so bad that like you can't take time off. This is your job. You're stuck. Like you have to deal with this no matter how how awful people are to you. And I'm like yeah, that's part of the job. That's part of, like I, I don't have the option to just like I'm just going to take a quarter off. I'm done with people for a while. We, we're just going to be in this. But I do feel bad for people who are like getting that level of just meanness and, and animosity and I think it, for a lot of people it's really good I think it's healthy even though like as much as I want secular pro-life bloggers to be doing their thing I think there's a lot of really good stuff on the SPL blog like take care of yourself first take care of your soul your mental health your emotional health and sometimes that means just having to take a break from people on the internet Monica also has another tip for us, which I think is really valuable. She says that if you say that you're going to leave the conversation, don't change your mind and come back. Yes. That's not really a fair move, and it just builds like distrust. So if you say, you know, it was great talking with you, but I'm just gonna I'm gonna log off now. I think you know this conversation has kind of reached its full potential or whatever. Right. And then people keep talking, and you jump back in later. It it's rude. It's like that person who does the big I'm leaving Facebook now thing and like makes a really big deal about it and then they're back in a week. Like I'm back. <laughs> you know, so I like come on, dude, like pick you're pick not going to be taken seriously. Doing. Yeah. That's a major credibility hit. Yep. She also tells us to not correct grammar or spelling. Yes. And that's just petty and annoying. <laughs> don't be that person. <laughs> At some point, I don't remember when Tim I think was the one to talk to me about the the fewer and less and how to and how to think about that because you're kind of like that you know, wasn't just me nitpicking yes, grammar though that's like you're a speaker we're being purposeful <laughs> about trying to appear smart when we're on stage in front of a live audience you gotta yes. try to fool people <laughs> <laughs> you know what we mean and so it, but and that was a bad habit of mine I, I just I, I didn't understand the difference for the longest time in my life and so for a while. Tim and my wife were correcting me every single time I mess this up. And it was really effective because now every single time I hear anyone use that word, I'm instantly doing the math. Can you count that? Can you not? Is it less? Is it fewer? And I instantly want to be the guy who's like, eh, fewer. Like, I, don't, I don't mess it up ever anymore. Like I'm completely, it's gone. I will probably never make the mistake again in my life because someone had to tell me a hundred times to stop making that mistake. And if you're on Facebook and your you're like one word response to someone is fewer, like, you know, like, dude, don't. I will mention that yesterday we were having lunch <laughs> <laughs> and I mistakenly said less when I should have said fewer. And Josh very nicely says, when you use the wrong form of between less and fewer do you want me to correct you or do you want me to let you just go <laughs> a or something, meta conversation. <laughs> something like that and you know josh and i are friends and i was fine with him saying that and i i want to be the best version of myself so i was like okay you could correct me but i really appreciated him asking instead of just correcting me i would have felt yeah. you know you, you, you know it's really it's supposed to be this way <laughs> uh, it, excuse me um actually it's supposed to be <laughs> <laughs> like so annoying, uh, so pretentious. Whom? <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you've never seen the Office episode where they just discuss whether or not it should be who or whom, it's amazing. Oh, that's excellent. <laughs> it was so good. Uh, Ryan needs me as an object. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm gonna try to find the clip and link it. I'll, I'll embed it. In the that's page. hilarious. All right, we're going to have to save the rest of this for another podcast or two. I'm really excited about kind of finishing up this series because I think there's a lot more really good kind of nitty-gritty practical stuff on this list, And but we've been going for over an hour now. So let's go ahead and stop now. We'll save that for either one more, at the most two more. We are not <laughs> doing more than five parts <laughs> on this series. I'm just going to say we're going to have to commit to that. Like, it's one or two more but I think, I think maybe we could do it in one we'll see maybe we'll, we'll see. see we basically <laughs> are never right when we guess if something's going to happen in one episode but we'll see if you know lightning strikes the planning fallacy strikes <laughs> again yeah